What is up, punks? It's Shinobi, and we're bringing you Block Digest episode 226 at block height 636,607 on Saturday, June 27th. So what is cracking, Janine? Nothing much, and by nothing much, I'm referring to this super long conversation that we had yesterday with a nothing much. Yeah, that is going to be a monster for people, I think. That that is the first time in I don't know how long that we just rolled through two hours on a special edition and weren't even close to stopping. Yep. Oh boy, but yeah, I have a feeling that today is going to be just as dense with shit. Mm-hmm. Alrighty, so uh, yeah, I guess. Seifu snafu. Yeah. Um. So um, there's really no uh nice way to put this. Uh, somebody somewhere fucked up. So James Prestwich um found the other day one of the UTXOs pegged into the liquid sidechain um, had let the CSV time lock on the emergency recovery path expire when it shouldn't have. Um, so pretty much this allowed until that UTXO was moved again a two of three um, key set that's held by Blockstream and kept air gapped and geographically distributed um, to spend those keys or the, the coins. And the whole point of this recovery path is that in the event of hardware failure, of protocol failure, of just anything taking the, the necessary threshold to sign blocks or move those coins on the main chain fail um, to still be able to recover them. And that is an incredibly important safety catch when you're talking about a system that's trying to be the, the settlement layer between financial institutions. So that's something that, if successful, will probably pull a very massive amount of Bitcoin into that ecosystem. And without a recovery path like this, um, that's all at risk of being lost in a system failure, which boils down ultimately to keys being destroyed or lost somewhere. Now, this should have never happened. And apparently there has been a couple different um, changes in the recent past to how the, the functionaries and the software that federators are using to manage the UTXOs on chain um, originally the design was apparently, um, it did not incorporate a kind of emergency feature to just move these coins to stop that path's time lock from expiring. There was an implicit assumption, um, that people just pegging into the, the network, which involves sending to a transitory address that is swept and condensed into a single UTXO with this federation and recovery key path um, immediately to keep the UTXO um, from fragmenting and creating a dust mess when you peg into the chain. And originally the assumption was people pegging in will just keep that from expiring. But obviously 
this early in the network's lifetime, um, people are not using it at that scale. People are not regularly pegging in like that. And so um, apparently they updated the, the software and we're planning on updating the actual hardware security modules the federators use um, to cover that situation. But the deployment of the actual hardware modules um, was disrupted because of all the crazy coronavirus shit happening, um, the lockdowns everywhere, and the massive you know, shipping and supply chain disruptions that's caused. Now that said, um, that's just the overall context of how this happened. Um, this should not have happened. And part of the entire design rationale here is that the Federation, as long as the network is live and operational, are constantly guaranteeing that these coins are not spendable by Blockstream and this uh, distributed recovery key set. Um, and that that only becomes a valid spending path if something disruptive happens to the network that prevents those UTXOs from being renewed on chain. So, yeah, um, this was a fuck up. That is undeniable. But ultimately, um, you know, show me the example of a system like this, depending on trusted hardware and entities that has ever been deployed. Um, it doesn't exist. This is rooted to a bearer asset that is irrecoverable in certain failure modes. And shit's going to happen. I mean, it is what it is. But long term, like there are a, a few different things that can be done to ameliorate this. Um, one is the dynamic federation um, setup that um, is in the elements code base right now, but not liquid, that allows both in terms of the side chain consensus and the custody of the coins on the main chain, um, allows the federation to dynamically add or remove participants from those key sets. Now, that does not have to happen in sync. Um, that could be used to kind of separate the influence here in this system. And you could very easily have an environment where, say, a set of 100 people are all involved in the signing keys for the sidechain um, consensus process. But you have 20 different isolated groups that have zero overlap that are custodying coins on the main chain. And those can be represented as different tokens inside of Liquid. So you can try to deal with this in one way by just distributing the trust away from a single group of people in terms of who's custodying the coins on the main chain that are pegged into the side chain. So in the very long term, like this type of failure surface um, can be dealt with just by spreading it around so there is not that single surface. But also, you know, I've been thinking um, since I saw this yesterday, um, this would be another application potentially for things like watchtowers. Um, in the process of creating any new UTXO on chain, um, they could tweak the, the software and the hardware security module interactions and functions to automatically create an end lock time, um, transaction that refreshes this, um, UTXO so that the block stream recovery key path doesn't happen. Um, it does not activate and you could, you know, I'm thinking you could really take that to such a degree that random people in their mom's basement could literally have that pre-signed transaction. And all it takes is one of them to broadcast it after the unlock time is expired. If that UTXO hasn't been renewed already, um, and prevent this kind of accidental, allowance of Blockstream to be able to spend these UTXOs um, outside of the failure mode where that's supposed to happen. But, you know, overall, it's, 
There are a lot of ways that this can be dealt with in the long term and the big picture. There are ways to safeguard against this specifically in the short term. But you know, ultimately, I, I can't really say anything else here except I don't see this as a a demonstration that these types of platforms don't work. Um, but somebody definitely fucked up here. Um, and this was not supposed to happen. So it's probably time to think about how to make this type of system a lot more robust and comprehensive in terms of safety catches for stuff like this. Not getting nope. paid for that one. Nope. Although maybe you're not being harsh enough. I mean, it's... IOUs. the fuck out of here with that shit well you know but i mean you know overall it's the point is like this was a failure of the intended operation and trust model here um that's undeniable but ultimately this is a system based on trust and distributing that so yeah i mean this was a big fuck up um, this needs to be addressed specifically and narrowly in terms of this exact thing can never happen again. But also just think in the long term about how this type of trust model and system can be made more robust. Like, you know, there, there have been instances of people having money stolen on the Lightning Network. Um, does that mean that Lightning is a complete useless dead end? No, but there was a problem um, that needed to be acknowledged. It needed to be fixed and addressed. Um, and that's how this shit works. You know, like we're going to get into something later too um, involving Lightning. Like just because something is out there um, and deployed does not mean that it has to be exactly perfect in its instantiation right now or just throw it in the garbage. Um, there are going to be a lot of incidents like this or, or problems fundamentally with all of the stuff that we try to build on Bitcoin because people don't get shit right at first. But that doesn't change the fact that you should hold people to account when fuck ups happen. You know, like I am very sure that there are people um, who are probably going to be even more hesitant than they were previously to even consider using liquid because of this incident. Mm -hmm. But I mean, ultimately, it's like acknowledge what happened here. Let's figure out a solution to prevent it in the future. And uh, yeah, I don't want to just say move on and don't call this out as a fuck up, but we do need to move on eventually. And also, um, you know, one last thing I kind of want to point out is to some degree, um, I would call this more a fuck up of the Federation than Blockstream. Because the entire structure of this is they are in control, they are operating this, and they are the responsible party for guaranteeing that any emergency control that Blockstream could assert over the network um, does not actually become allowed without the types of failures it's there for. So like people actually operating functionaries on Liquid here, um, they fucked up not paying attention to this and not being on top of um, their role as a consensus participant in a system like this. Yeah, more uh, don't trust verify, please. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I mean, I don't really have anything more to say except continuing to repeat that uh, people fucked up. <laughs> I think this next one is more of an entertaining Twilight Zone um, cyberpunk occurrence, though, <laughs> if you want to take us into that, uh, if you don't have anything else to say on this. 
Yeah, there is uh, currently some actors uh, on the world stage who are not showing as much much hesitation as others. Um, not exactly good news, but anyway, uh, someone on Twitter going by the name of Javier Bastardo pointed out on the 24th that the Venezuelan government in power slash regime is apparently accepting Bitcoin as a payment method for passports. Um, using a BTC or what looks very similar to a BTC pay server instance. Um, now, obviously, BTC pay server as a software project has no control over this. They just write open source software. There's no centralized controller for server instances. So any person or government anywhere in the world could use it to manage Bitcoin payments, and they don't have any responsibility or control over that. Um, so, you know, meh, interesting, but not necessarily good news. Um, but then Javier also wanted to point out that it is more accurate to refer to them as Maduro's regime in his view, because, uh, government is a really bad euphemism since elections and democracy are a tale here. Um, I know that Venezuela could be, a uh, a little weird, but Maduro is more likely a dictator than a president. These news, uh, this news is good because it shows that Bitcoin is is really for enemies, or as in it can be used by enemies as well as uh, allies. But um, it's also bittersweet to us. In the same thread, um, someone uh, going by the name K3M commented that um, that feeling when a backward socialist regime in America is when, wait, what that feeling when a backwards, I assume, well, the Americas, um, that feeling when a backwards socialist regime in the Americas is technologically more advanced than all other first world nation state governments, which is, uh, that's true. <laughs> yeah. Um, definitely wouldn't call this a good thing, but I would absolutely call it a significant thing, especially with their petrodollar project and the fact that they have actually launched um, their own national shitcoin um, forked from Dash. To see them accept Bitcoin um, as an option for government services like a passport, um, like they're accumulating Bitcoin. Like they are trying to do that. Um, that that is just completely undeniable at this point. Like that is no longer a circumstantial argument from rumors and little bits of information. They are directly accepting it as payment on a government site and not through some kind of fiat bridge or, or payment provider through actual direct software that can only natively interact with Bitcoin itself. Like they are accumulating Bitcoin. Yes, I mean, obviously, uh, I, <laughs> we do not recommend anyone uh, helping them along with that and actually trying to purchase a passport <laughs> with Bitcoin, because not only is that bad for your privacy, but these are not the kind of people that you want to give your Bitcoin to. Yeah, give them shitty fiat, because every single Satoshi that a regime like that acquires is more potential runway to continue existing as a psychopathic regime like that. Well, to be clear, don't give them anything, even shitty feeling. <laughs> well, I mean, it's, yeah, but I, I would imagine that it would be very hard to try to get out of that country for good without a passport. So that, that particularly, um, you know, if people are trying to run, they don't really have an option on that one. I mean, yeah, that's also going to be interesting because obviously just because the Venezuelan regime is getting involved in cryptocurrency stuff, that doesn't mean that they're okay with their citizens using it. So I'm kind of wonder, like, is this supposed to be a signal that they are kind of okay with it if it means that they can potentially get paid in it? Or is this some kind of honeypot to find the Bitcoiners in Venezuela? Well, I mean, honestly, given how Maduro acts 
ah, flip a coin. <laughs> like both of those seem equally plausible to me. But, but uh, uh, in in better news, um, BTC Pay Server, um, I think the the foundation, um, they have received a one hundred fifty thousand dollar grant from Kraken. Uh, which they say is the biggest donation that they've ever received so far. And in a blog post, uh, they say, We were over the moon when an email from Jesse Powell arrived in our inbox with that email. Um, besides a concise, uh, we'd like to support you guys. Jesse mentioned that they've launched BTC Pay Server integration on CryptoWatch, their premium trading terminal that provides real-time cryptocurrency market data. That put a big grin on our faces. Not only did they want to support our work, but they're using the software we've been building for the past two and a half years. However, we weren't surprised. Um, the reason we expected this is due to our community. Since the launch of the BTC Pay Server Foundation, we've been receiving constant when Kraken messages via DMs and in our community chat. The passion that people put into the communities of both Kraken and ours to make this happen is truly incredible. Uh, continued, they say, our focus this year is to make BTC Pay Server easier to use by ironing out the interface, but also adding a better workflow, especially in the initial setup which includes installation, creating your first account and store, and configuring your wallet. We're confident that we can tremendously improve that part of the user's workflow in the next few months to come. At the same time, another goal is greater flexibility for developers. We want to offer a Swiss knife type of stack that can help anybody in building a Bitcoin business with ease and versatility on top of BTC Pay Server. Yeah, this is actually really awesome i mean you know I, I a lot of the the reaction um to this has been a lot of complaining and yelling uh about kraken's business model in terms of the litany of shit coins they support but honestly who who cares um they're not going to go anywhere and it's at least a net benefit in my opinion to be funding these types of software projects in this space like if these businesses are going to make money, um, you know, suckering people into shit coins, which they will, um, at least direct some of that into important Bitcoin projects like this, you know, like BTC pay, I think is, it really is going to be one of the most important pieces of software in this space for probably the next five to 10 years at a minimum. Yeah, and I also want to point out, because something that not a lot of people are aware of is that um, BTC Pay Server isn't just a, it's not just an application and, you know, server infrastructure for merchants. It's also, like, it has a bunch of other apps in it that, that for example, a journalist could use. There's a few publishing apps um that are that work with it um there's libra patron and then there's also one that i think is made by blockstream or someone sponsored by blockstream um so there's a bunch of different applications that work for it you don't have to be like this isn't just a thing that you would set up if you're running a store as part of your business this is this, this is well a business as in like you're selling you know, products or something like that. This could be something that you use just for accepting Bitcoin for your personal use or uh, as a writer and content creator. Mm -hmm. It's like, it really is a, like the engine to just facilitate commerce, period, like of all kinds on the internet. And it's like, yeah. The, the type of comprehensive way that they're covering all of those use cases is really fucking impressive. Alrighty, though. Um, I think I'm going to slide us along. Uh, I'm actually going to squeeze um, something else in um, that wasn't on the news desk. But, um, you know, <clears throat> there are uh, a lot of square... Uh, crypto grants going around um, lately and I'm going to dive kind of deep into or a little deep into one after this but um, first one I want to mention is that uh, Chris Belcher um, is the receiver of their 12th grant um, in this grant machine gun uh, wave uh, to work on CoinSwap 
So this is in addition to the, I think at this point he's received um, grants or donations from Square Crypto, the Human Rights Foundation, and then uh, Wasabi Wallet, right? Uh, yes, as far as I know, yeah. Z well, with ZK Snacks, yeah. Mm -hmm. But like, yeah, so this, this is, you know, just fucking awesome. Um, like Chris has been building a lot of shit in this space, um, and just designing a lot of shit in this space for years. And the entire time he's pretty much just been doing it on his own time or, or money or just pure donations from the community and users. So it is really fucking awesome to see actual businesses in this space kind of step up and try to help support him in doing that because he's just been doing it without all of that support and financial aid this entire time. So it, it's, it's just fucking awesome to see <clears throat> that these people who have been effectively donating their time to this space for free like they're actually getting the the financial help to guarantee that they can keep doing that. Alrighty. So next up, I think um, this was their seventh grant. Yeah. Okay. Um, seventh grant um, is going to uh, Dev Random and Ken Sedgwick, who are working on um, the lightning um wow brain not good today um lsp the uh lightning um signers project yes okay um but pretty much the idea behind this is kind of trying to separate the actual key management in lightning implementation out of the actual lightning node itself and generalize this to um, something that can be housed in a hardware security module or external um, device or software that actually handles the, uh, the key signing. Um, because right now, you know, obviously you're running a, a lightning node, you have a channel open, um, that's a hot wallet. And this, this entire project is pretty much just trying to disentangle um the deep integration of the the wallet and the key aspect in lightning nodes to something a lot more abstract where um that device or external signer or what have you can actually just interact with the node in not a trustless way but in a way where it is verifying some of the information being fed to it by the lightning node um, and have its own independent oracle for um, kind of the UTXOs on chain and kind of separate out the functionality in, in software a little bit here so that it's a lot easier to specialize, um, to move that out into a hardware device if you want, and just in general have a, a much more secure model um, in terms of key management for lightning nodes versus just dump it in, in the, the node and the, the wallet software and just let it run hot. So this is, um, I don't absolutely mission critical for lightning to really be safe and scalable in the long term. So this is fucking awesome. Alrighty. Are we ready to get into some very, uh, disappointing things about the lightning network yep all right so first up is a potential ransom attack um that renee picard or disclosed on the uh lightning dev mailing list um so this is something that has been known about for quite a while, um, somewhere around a year or so, um, in terms of the actual implementation developers. <clears throat> but uh, Renee's decided to kind of just publicly disclose this because two of the implementations out there um, have a, a kind of quick monkey patch to deal with this. Um, and the one that doesn't, LND, um, they are aware of it. 
and there was actually communication between Renee and uh, Roast Beef before this was publicly disclosed. But pretty much um, the idea is that if you as a malicious node can get somebody to open a channel with you, um, they're the ones paying the on-chain fees in the uh, non-cooperative um, transaction commitments. So the idea here is to effectively um, route a bunch of HTLCs through that channel simultaneously, as many as you possibly can. Um, and the current um, spec limit is 483 HTLC outputs. Um, and then just stop cooperating. Um, refuse to sign any um, changes in the fee levels um, to the transactions, any new channel states. And pretty much the idea here is that if you do this during an environment of fees spiking very high, um, what implementations end up doing just to be safe is they overestimate um, the fee level required to get a transaction to hit chain. And so in the numbers um, Renee put forward to kind of explain this, assume you have a uh, 150 sats per byte fee level. Um, the current um, bolt specification uh, dictating um, fee decisions would have you estimate that at around 750 Satoshis a byte fee level when you sign um, a new commitment transaction. And so with the maximum amount of HTLCs that you can have in a single channel, um, 483, um, an HTLC output is 43 bytes. Um, that winds up being literally 0.15 Bitcoins in fees to claim this on chain. Um, and so the mitigation that Sea Lightning and Eclair have made is to simply um, limit the amount of simultaneous HTLCs to somewhere around 30, um, far below the actual Bolt specification. And um, LND currently um, does not have any additional uh, limitations. Um, it You could with LND, um, pretty much create um, a channel commitment state that had these 483 individual HTLC outputs. And now at a base level here, um, a malicious person can just do this and make you eat this loss um, with no gain for themselves. Um, in a more complicated way, and Renee says that um, he doesn't really see how you could practically pull off blackmailing somebody like in the sense of setting this up and then um, try to communicate with them and extort them um, into signing a much more efficient channel closure that just gave them a bunch of money um, because you're going to lose it anyway. Um, but another subtle thing that he points out here is... Um, Miners. A, a malicious miner could integrate themselves into the Lightning Network um, simply to pull this attack and create a massive fee transaction that would benefit themselves. Um, so that, at least in my mind, creates potential incentive conflicts between lightning node operators and miners that I think could get very bad potentially um, with malicious actors there. Um, so that is something I really haven't had too much time to really think deeply about, but just to say the least, um, that makes me very uncomfortable in that there would be no way to identify really or prove that a 
a malicious entity in the Lightning Network was actually a miner who is actually potentially at least um, if they find the block with that transaction first um, directly financially benefiting from this. So that's something I think that should really be deeply thought about in terms of, um, you know, further mitigations for this or um, like actually incorporating um, a more comprehensive solution into the bolt specification itself. Are we just going to go right into the other other disappointing thing? Yeah, might as well. So, um, how do I put this? Uh, pretty much, um, the common perception of the privacy guarantees of payments over Lightning Network um, that everybody has been propagating or, or held, and I am just as guilty as everybody else here, um is a complete mirage um yeah light, lightning payments um are nowhere near as private um as as people think they are um to the nodes actually participating in routing um a payment for people and um that that just might be a fundamentally unfixable thing like that might be something that we can improve we can lower the accuracy rating because this is all probabilistic of um, payment de-anonymizations but looking at this right now um, it might be just fundamentally unfixable in the sense that you might not be able to make a completely airtight um, fix to this. But the, the general idea is pretty much through using um, timing analysis of like how long it actually takes for um, channel states to be updated between individual peers on the nodes and the time lock value of the malicious actors um, route or hop in the payment because if you remember the time locks along a payment um, get progressively shorter and shorter um, the closer they get to the recipient to guarantee that the HTLC if it has to hit chain will allow every participant to exit the contract honestly um, and pretty much um, just brute forcing um, there are very high success rates for de-anonymizing the two endpoints in a payment over Lightning. And so what the attacker would have to do is first, they start out by building a map of the latency of different nodes on the network. And they do this by um, creating payments and routing them through the network that intentionally have a hop in them that will fail the payment so that they don't actually incur a cost aside from having to lock the money up temporarily. And what they'll do is just start routing everywhere through the entire network. And they will progressively extend routes um, and they will go through and map each individual node's latency in terms of channel update speeds. So like how quickly you move to finalize an HTLC hop, propagate information back, like how long it takes that device um, in terms of latency to actually go through a channel update. And what it can do is identify that number for a specific channel, and then it can route another hop through. And then it has the value for the original channel. So looking at the totals, it can arrive at that value for the next channel. And it maps out the entire um, network um, in this way. And then from that point, when they have payments routing through them, um, they can analyze that 
figure out the time lock delta for their hop in that payment, and then measuring the latency of how long it actually takes changes to ripple through the entire payment route um, because they can kind of position themselves in terms of number of hops based on that time lock value. Um, they pretty much go to this latency map that they've made for the whole network and crunch through all the possible combinations of what um, individual hops could have made this payment um, by checking the total latency of that path against the observed latency <clears throat> in the payment they're processing. Um, and with a very high degree of probability, identify the two endpoints, the sender and the receiver in a lightning payment. <clears throat> so there are things like getting rid of hash pre-images and using payment points or adapter signatures um, kind of improve things a little bit. They give less fingerprints to go um, off of in terms of isolating things. Um, having different uh, aspects of a route through multi-path um, routing that could help improve things because amount correlations, if a malicious actor has multiple nodes on the network, um, don't really fingerprint as tightly. But ultimately, this is just down to the timing of the actual interactions between nodes on the network. So none of these things comprehensively solve the problem they just kind of lower the the accuracy and really the only thing that would solve this would be to introduce random delays um in terms of the timing of channel updates and channel state transitions um randomized to some degree to completely throw off the ability to even build this this latency map accurately or apply the the latency fingerprint of a single lightning payment um, to a map that existed and that kind of breaks the the entire design and user experience or interface of lightning which is supposed to be the quick instant confirmed payments and so it's kind of a rock in a hard place in this way um you can either, you know, and not, not literally fatally, like lightning will not work now, but you kind of either have to break the intended um, function mode of lightning quick and instant in order to solve this issue. And if you don't break that, then this issue exists. And that winds up being that the privacy um, assumptions of lightning payments are nowhere near as private as uh, all of us thought. Yeah, so um, I hadn't looked at this paper, but it's actually pretty timely, not pun intended, uh, because one of the things I'm including in my newsletter is ZK channels, which we kind of briefly mentioned that several episodes back when I was talking about the uh, Zcash Developer Alliance, which despite the connections to Zcash and the fact that a lot of the team members working on ZK channels are kind of, it sounds like they're students of Matthew Green. Um, so besides that... Um, I still think it's uh, it's an interesting thing to look at because it's basically using zero knowledge proofs for the Lightning Network. And like I said in the episode where I briefly mentioned this, I kind of think that that was going to come eventually. I don't know if this particular implementation um, is is good enough because it was released in April and I actually haven't been able to find uh, anyone who's analyzed or checked it yet. Um, but it, uh, it is a, basically a fork of LND, so it uses the same fundamentals that are already being used in the Lightning Network, but they've just extended it to add um, zero-knowledge proofs and multi-party 
computation. So, and that, that code is available on GitHub. So I feel like maybe this would be a good time for people who want to fix this problem and in a long run build a more private uh, Lightning Network to take a look at that and see whether it's viable to use. Yeah, I actually, <clears throat> I need to finally uh, dive through that so we can go a little more in depth uh, into it on the show. But all you stupid fucking Bitcoin developers won't stop building things everywhere. Fucking stop. Ah, oh, man. But yeah, I guess uh, you want to take us into... Um, some mind-blowing uh, financial drama going on right now. Yeah, so in the world outside of Bitcoin, you have probably heard about the insolvency of Wirecard AG, which is a German payment processor and financial service provider. Um, basically, a bunch of money that they thought they had didn't really exist, and so they have declared insolvency recently, which is a big deal because that's a lot of money that just went poof. Um, of course, there's a lot of financial institutions whose money has gone poof or appeared mysteriously with not really clear origin. But anyway, uh, if you remember all the way back in, uh, in episode 112, 112, we talked about a certain uh, famous security expert who made this big show about how he was never going to sell his super famous domain crypto.com to anyone and then ended up selling it to a cryptocurrency card company called monaco uh which did uh, an ico and proceeded to create or were in the process of creating their own visa debit card that uh used crypto to back it um, and the issuer of the cards, and also the 10x debit cards, is Wirecard AG, um, which, you know, some people, like, it's it's funny, I agree, but just to be clear, it's not a super exclusive partnership. There are probably lots of companies where Wirecard acts as the issuer, so it's not a super... It's not a super noteworthy connection, but it's still just worth pointing out that, you know, <laughs> this the, the the whole reason that um that Matt Blaze was saying like Matt Blaze in general doesn't really have any interest in cryptocurrencies and thinks probably thinks they're a scam, at least according to his prior comments. And that was the primary reason behind him repeatedly refusing to sell his domain, which is like, you know, screw you, blockchain people, I'm not going to sell it to you. And then he ends up doing that, and it ends up being connected to Alibite loosely to <laughs> to a major uh, insolvency crisis. Kind of interesting. Uh, but anyway, the CEO of Crypto.com, the new Crypto.com, Chris, uh, tweeted, Wirecard AG filed for insolvency in Germany today. To all of our card customers, your fiat funds are safe and guaranteed by Crypto.com. In, in case any of the services provided by Wirecard are disrupted, you will receive a fast 100% credit back to your crypto wallet. Now, this part confused me because uh, he, he only said fiat funds. So what about the crypto funds, Chris? Are they safe? Um just kidding, kind of, not really. Uh, furthermore, 10x, which I'm sure we've probably shit it on before. I could not find the episode where we might have done that, but 10x would like to make clear that all of your, all of our customers' crypto and fiat and fiat. Oh look, they did the good thing. Crypto and fiat balances <laughs> are maintained by 10x and not Wirecard. We will keep you up to date on any important information and changes. As of now, this issue has no impact on our operation. Of course. Um, I uh, have no reason to believe that they won't be affected or they could not be affected in some way. And I also just don't trust custodial things, period. So I don't know. This seems like a pretty big thing when like billions of dollars just kind of go poof um, and you have business ties to those companies that that can affect you. So you might just want to protect yourself and just to be safe, remove any funds that you have with either of these services just saying yeah i mean 
that that is just mind boggling to me that a card issuer like this just poof billions of dollars gone like what the fuck mm -hmm. like that that's like this is th those instances in in the fiat system where at an absolute bare minimum just apply cryptography even if it is totally centralized even if there is an absolute authority apply cryptography like holy shit the amount of massive systemic fraud and money just going poof with no explanation or like this is insane cryptography has existed for literally almost a century in the terms of asymmetric cryptography apply it like oh my god all righty though speaking of applying cryptography so uh commerce block for those who are familiar with them um have a protocol called mainstay which is pretty much um it is a specific protocol for creating chains of transactions that allow new UTXOs to be introduced, but require exactly one output so that a, this chain of transactions is never fanning out and creating multiple descendant um, chains that could commit to conflicting states. And use this as the, the root of a time stamping mechanism where you can actually um, have some single reference point in knowing that all the relevant timestamps you want are committed to in this single um, chain of transactions. So you don't have to worry about any conflicting um, commitments that are attached to any other chain of transactions than that one. Um, they actually just deployed a um, new API functionality and apps that allow users or businesses to pretty much roll up the state of every um, thing stored in a specific uh, folder or subdirectory in their Dropbox, um, Google Drive, or Microsoft OneDrive um, to have a constant rolling um, proof of existence at the at least the granularity of block intervals for all of their data and this is fucking awesome um this is exactly the type of general use of time stampings that i have been screaming at people to bake into everything everywhere from the minute that open timestamps was invented um and this is a very simple um software um application that just allows you to hook this up to the three biggest cloud providers out there. Um, and now there is one kind of downside that I think everybody listening now is immediately going to check out um, because you actually have to KYC yourself um, and pay a subscription fee to use Mainstay. Um, so as it is right now, um, I think this is mostly something um, generally useful and applicable to businesses, to corporations with lots of records that they would like an exact um, kind of state record for all the changes and um, existence times of all the files in their company. But I have been talking a little bit um, with some of the guys over there. And I think that a perfect way to kind of open this up would be the LSAT um, Macaroon authentication um, specification built on Lightning Network um, being worked on right now. And something similar or, or maybe even exactly, um, you know, use Strike um, from Jack Mahler's 
to be able to charge granularly for single uses of a service like this without having to kind of KYC yourself and go through the the subscription process they have right now, which is pretty much geared towards businesses and not individuals. So KYC light. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, right now, um, I know that a lot of people probably aren't nerding out about timestamping being baked into everything because the the nature of this being targeted to businesses and KYC. But I absolutely think um, using Lightning and LSAT that you could do this in a way that opened it up to the use of individuals without invasive privacy leaks. So expect Shinobi to continue poking people until such a thing pops into existence. All right, what is next? Okay, um, I'm going to dive through these two kind of quickly. Um, it's not really much meat, but LND is recently merged a, um, how do I call this? A hook to intercept um, hash time lock contracts being relayed by your node so that you can create customized, um, you know, non-standard responses to those HTLCs, like maybe not forward them or add extra conditions to forward them and so on. And um, Breeze is actually um, commenting about this on Twitter and pretty much looking at the uses um, they can put this to um, as you know, I'm not a big fan of it, but their model is trying to be a lightning service provider in the sense of they're offering much more than just the software um, to you as a user. But, you know, th these are things that could um, help implementations of lightning rod or, um, you know, doing things like creating a channel on the fly to facilitate a, a payment routed through lightning and things like this. And so this is a really good um, feature tweak for LND in the sense that um, it, it's facilitating a, a lot more services or kind of inventive or original ways to build things on top of Lightning using LND as a base. And, you know, that's always been one of my criticisms of them is kind of not being modular or really um, composable like that. Um, to, to be useful for people actually building businesses and services. But it, they've really been trying to kind of move more in that direction a lot lately. So that's definitely something nice to see. And then also um, Blue Wallet just uh, dumped a major new release um, on the 23rd that comes with... Uh, some integration with HODL HODL, um, the ability to buy Bitcoin directly in the app, um, as well as um, some features centered around that. But, you know, I honestly wanted to just kind of circle back and mention this because really the only two times um, I can recall at least covering Blue Wallet on the show was for really like egregious bugs that should just not have happened in the first place um, that had the potential to lose people money. And I came down really hard on them for that at the time. But, you know, honestly, keeping an eye on them uh, as things have been developing from that point, I haven't really seen any kind of egregious bugs or, or screw ups like that since then. And they actually have been, you know, really building out a lot of features and flexibility for users in terms of software that can interact with lightning. And so I just want to say, you know, I th maybe I did come down on them a little hard. Um, and they seem to have been making a lot of massive progress since then. So yeah, I, I just wanted to say that. Is Shinobi apologizing? No. Of course not. But, uh, yeah. Want to take us into the rumor mill? Uh, well, first of all, I just wanted to make one clarifying point about the, um, 
the Venezuela BTC pay server story. Um, I want to point out because you mentioned, oh, well, maybe people in Venezuela with Bitcoin might, if they want to escape the country, they need a passport. So it turns out that if if this thing is actually happening, it would not actually be available to Venezuelans in Venezuela. It was actually, uh, it appears to be targeted at Venezuelans who are outside the country. So it would not it would not help people within Venezuela to get a passport as a means of leaving. Okay, so they're just trying to suck money back um, from people who've already escaped. Yeah, yeah, they're like, well, you're already gone, so we might as well take your your actual good money uh, if you're gonna keep staying away. Yeah, that makes a lot more sense. But uh, speaking of people who take your money and uh, shut you down, um, three anonymous sources, well, according to Coindesk, three anonymous sources have claimed to them that PayPal and Venmo plan to roll out direct crypto buying and selling on their platforms, um, besides the fact that PayPal is already often an option for withdrawing fiat from several types of exchange services. Uh, still at this point, I think this came out a few days ago and I don't, I didn't give enough of a shit to even check what day it came out, but it was like in the last week or so. And at this point, as far as I know, it's still just a rumor. And all I really have to say about it is I don't trust either of these companies with any significant amount of fiat money, let alone Bitcoin. Um, also remember that PayPal was mostly involved in the banking blockade, the illegal, um, the extra judicial banking blockade of WikiLeaks, which was the primary reason that WikiLeaks ended up adopting Bitcoin in the first place and reportedly profiting massively off of that uh, since then from that decision. So... The writing on the wall should be clear. Uh, don't use PayPal, or at the very least, don't let PayPal maneuver itself into a position where they're stocking up on Bitcoin because normies with no sense of history are willing to buy into their garbage offering. Like, I get it. People are like, oh, but this will this will improve access to Bitcoin. It's like, guys, guys, remember, like... <laughs> PayPal is used by people who often, I mean, as of a few years ago, it was pretty much used by people who already have a lot of options for financial access. That has increasingly become less and less of the case. Uh, you had, um, for example, SciHub was cut off from PayPal many, many, many years ago. Uh, a whole bunch of people have been cut off by PayPal in rather infamous incidents. So it's kind of like how Coinbase says that they want to build an open financial system when in actuality, the people that are able to use Coinbase are actually a smaller percentage of people than probably have bank accounts uh, because it's actually in many ways easier to open a bank account than Coinbase. So yeah, I'm. I have no reason to be excited about this. I don't care if it's true because at the end of the day, I don't want to see people buying and possibly holding any cryptocurrency on a centralized service that has shown it is perfectly willing to engage in extra judicial censorship. Yeah, um, I would not, for the life of me, send anybody <laughs> to PayPal for Bitcoin. But it, it, this is clearly just a reaction, um, in my opinion, to Cash App's massive success integrating Bitcoin. Um, like the the amount of revenue and profit that Cash App has generated from that, it's insane. And they're just looking, where's our piece of the pie? Yeah, the, the funny part is, um, I can't remember what conference it was, but there there was at one point a libertarian conference that had or it claimed to have Peter Thiel as a speaker, and they credited him as like the co-founder of PayPal, a non-state currency, 
And I found that hilarious because like, no, <laughs> I literally tweeted directly at PayPal saying, Hey, are you a non-state currency? And they responded, we have a number of, we have a number of, uh, of national currency options available at pay. It's like this, this whole meme of Peter Thiel being a libertarian needs to die. He is the complete opposite in like all of his actions of, of a libertarian or anyone who actually cares and acts in a way that they want to reduce the power of the state. He is the complete opposite of that. And PayPal is also the complete opposite of that. They are not, they are not on the side of financial freedom. Yeah. Um, I would consider it fair to call him a conservative, but a libertarian. Yeah, no. I mean, literally, the guy is like, you know what he did at PayPal or towards the end of being majorly involved it, with PayPal? He looked at <laughs> he looked at PayPal's uh, anti-fraud algorithms, like to check for unusual account activity. And he's like, he, he, this is literally what he, he's like, I could use this to catch terrorists. And out of that decision, you got Palantir. Like, this is... This is, I don't know how anyone could conceive of him as a libertarian. Political labels like that don't really mean much these days. Yeah, and also um, someone in the chat pointing out that uh, there's reason to be skeptical about Coin Coindesk and whether they even have sources. I completely agree. That's why I don't want to give much credibility to the... I, I mean, I'm just, you know, we're going to mention it because everyone's been talking about it. And I kind of just wanted to use it as an opportunity to say, I don't care and fuck PayPal. Um, but other than that, like, I literally, I don't, I don't give... I don't have any trust in Coinbase or Coinbase. Well, I don't have trust in Coinbase either, but I don't have any. <laughs> <laughs> I definitely don't trust Coinbase, but I also don't trust Coindesk uh, in terms of, um, yeah, when you, every, every t whenever you have this whole like anonymous source thing, like I completely, I completely support having anonymous sources when they actually have, when they're when they're supposedly giving information when they about exist. When, when they exist but also i support sources being anonymous when giving out that information could be a threat to their life in the case of like state secrets whistleblowing kind of thing um but when when it's when you get these stories of just like here's something that a company that I may or may, may or may not be involved with is planning to do in the future. Like, sure, could they potentially, you know, get some kind of career uh, fallback for having their name attached to that disclosure? Sure. They're not going to go to jail for it, most likely. So I, this whole like anonymous source thing for these rumors is kind of boring me. And so I don't, I have, I honestly have no idea if this rumor is true. It's kind of like the whole thing about Amazon starting to accept Bitcoin. It just come, it pops up every now and then, and it doesn't seem to have any weight. So. Mm -hmm. And I mean, also like another aspect of that, and this is something that so many journalists are just cluelessly unaware of. Um, this could just be people not wanting their names attached to a proposal publicly yet, just trying to feel out public support. And the journalist is just being used as the mechanism to do that. Yeah, but of course, they're going to publish it because they want to be the one that broke the story. Always. Mm -hmm. And the funny part, I mean, it's unrelated, but this recent um, controversy with Slate Star Codex and the fact that the New York Times, despite having a long, long, long policy of quoting anonymous sources on a frequent basis, suddenly decided for this guy who posed no threat that they could identify. I don't even I don't even know if they've published the article yet. Um, maybe they decided not to, which would be smart. But they just randomly decided that this one guy that they wanted to profile, they had to include his full name because that's our policy. It's like, no, it's not. You're just being selective assholes. Mm -hmm. 
And like, I don't know much about that guy, but he claims to be um, a psychiatrist. And like his entire comment on like why it's fucked up to dox him like this is because like you can't like you are not supposed to know personal shit about your psychiatrist. You are not supposed to know their view on politics, like what they like to do. That creates perceptions of of that person in the patient's head that shape their trust of them like how they interact with them, how willing they are to reveal certain things to them and literally doxing him and connecting this long running blog of his to his real name. Like that very much destroys his ability to do his job. And he's not the only one who gets fucked there. Um, his patients are who now all have to transition to an entirely different person with which they share deep personal things about their lives. So yeah. like, it's despicable. Yeah. And um, I don't know who made it, but there was a, there was a really funny uh, like mini blog that popped up to make commentary on that whole situation. And the, uh, I think it's called the Institute of, I actually don't remember. Um, I'll probably add the link in the description because it's just funny. Um, it's kind of written from a, uh, they use words like, you know, comrade and uh, stuff like that. It's written from a, you know, that kind of lens. But I just thought it was really funny that they wrote, uh, the blogger behind Slate Star Codex was recently threatened with having his real identity exposed, um, known in the pseudonymous Wild West of the internet as doxing, by the New York Times, a blog which predates his by 162 years. Some fellows of the Institute enjoy his work, others do not, but on this issue we stand united. The Time blog boasts, by some estimates, that um, as much as double the readership of Slate Star Codex and on a point of principle, we stand up for the underblog. Um, our hero was told that the policy of the nation's blog of record is always to use the real names of figures on which it is reporting. However, the tireless work of our own investigative Googling desk <laughs> has discovered that the Times routinely offers anonymity to those who request it, to, do to those who think it'd be cool to be anonymous, and to those whose anonymity its staff find particularly amusing. Um, I just found it super funny that they referred to the Times as a blog and... <laughs> yeah, because at the end of the day, it's true. Like the 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 amount of like verification and the presentation of information nowadays for online news media is converging, and and sometimes going under the quality level of your average blog. So. I think this is a great practice to start referring to these things as blogs because they're almost indistinguishable nowadays. Yeah. Alrighty. So want to dive into the fun news from the probably singular um, competent person still left at Coindesk? Yes. All previous comments aside. <laughs> All right, so um, the drama escalates in Bitmain. Um, so McCreezan, um is now saying that he will buy out um, Jihan's 36% stock share for $4 billion um, of a, like in terms of company valuation. Um, and this is getting really weird um, in terms of dancing through shell companies who have different degrees of influence over this. Um, I'll get into that in a second. But McCreezan has also seized control. Um, I'm picturing in my head another private security team incident, like with the Beijing office um, in Shenzhen, where they house a lot of their equipment supply and is freezing shipments to customers right now while all of this is going on and i i hope i'm getting the shell structure correct here okay um there is beijing bitmain technology which is 
a fully owned subsidiary of Bitmain Technologies in Hong Kong, <clears throat> which is ultimately owned by Bitmain Technologies Holdings in the Cayman Islands. Okay, now see my interpretation here of what's what's happened, um, and don't quote me as a hundred percent accurate here. Um, that Jihan exerting influence in the Hong Kong entity um, stole the Beijing entity, at which point McCree um, retook control and is now initiating a legal suit against um, Jihan in the Cayman Islands with the top master company in the, the Cayman Islands. And now um, jumping over uh, to Molly, who actually I think just started working at Bitcoin Magazine. Um, she's from China and translated a lot of uh, <clears throat> things related to this um, from direct Chinese sources. But the one tweet in her thread I want to point out is McCree accusing Jihan of illegally embezzling um, company property for his personal use. Um, so yeah, if that's true, um, he could probably face very serious legal charges in China. And um, yeah, this, this entire situation is absurd. Uh, <laughs> like it's just the, the chain of shell companies with fighting at every level um, that just looks more and more like uh, both sides are doing highly outrageously illegal things um, at every level to try to take control of the company. Like this is this is absurd. The, uh, this is insane. It's absurd. This is like a fucking like dystopian cyberpunk like corporate civil war. <laughs> like what the fuck is going on? No idea. And like, you know, if if McCree is just stopping shipments to customers, like holy shit, how do either of them expect any outcome from this except this company implodes and goes bankrupt? It's insanity. Alrighty though. Uh tried to chunk these up together. Um a lot of wallet updates today. So Electrum is dropping a beta of their 4.0 wallet, or rather did drop, um, I think. But um, this is fucking epic, boys and girls. Um, full generalized PSBT support, their lightning implementation, a watchtower implementation baked in, and submarine swap support directly baked in. And now this is um, a sad part. Um, apparently the lightning functionality, um, it needs <clears throat> a full Electrum server index. Um, so you won't be able to use the lightning stuff with lightweight backends like uh, BWT or Electrum personal server. Um, but, you know, there are a lot of options out there as far as lightweight um, Electrum server implementations um, as we went into the, the last episode. So that's not that's not too bad of a, a pain point. But, <clears throat> yeah, um, this is awesome. This is opening up the compatibility um, to interact with any other PSBT supporting wallet out there on the main chain level, um, as well as a comprehensive um, lightning stack support. Like I, I, I didn't honestly even know that submarine swaps were going to be a part of this release, but like th this is awesome. Like th this isn't just the um, channel support implementation. So full watchtower implementation and a full atomic swap interaction between on and off chain. Like when this drops, um, 
in my mind, Electrum is not just a wallet anymore. Like this is a massive piece of infrastructure um, that I could honestly see, um, I don't know, turning into a competitor of sorts for some of the functionality of BTC pay server. Woo! Also, I don't know if, I don't think it's included in this release. It might be, but um, another upcoming thing that's going to be added, which I mentioned in the last episode, is the tool, uh, the scanning tool that Luke Childs is working on regarding, uh, you know, recovering seeds and discovery of existing accounts and coins and things, which is going to be really useful. Mm -hmm. yeah like this is like <clears throat> electrum is a beast now um i literally can't think of any other desktop wallet i would use after this release except a privacy wallet for like active mixing or something like this this is everything i would need bitcoin is getting awesome um so not as quite exciting but there's also an update for the Bitcoin um, wallet tracker, um, the Dav Ivgi's um, EPS-like tool. Um, so there are now improved uh, mempool tracking with, uh, whatchamacallit, um, that take into account kind of chains of unconfirmed transactions. Um, a little backend change on the HTTP API in terms of <clears throat> um, fields relating to replace by fee and fee rates, as well as, um, oh, I've got to scroll, um, pruning support um, for the, the plugin out of the box um, for a pruned node. So this is really, um, <clears throat> really turning into um, kind of what I hoped EPS would um, eventually, which is literally just something plugged and baked directly into Electrum itself so that you don't have to deal with kind of the extra configuration steps, <clears throat> the, uh, you know, the fumbling with config files and command line, which can get kind of scary for non-technical people. So, uh, yeah, th this is, I don't know, um, not to shit on EPS or like Belcher's work there, uh, getting that out there, but I'm kind of wondering at this point if BWT is just going to kind of supersede EPS as that lightweight way to hook up to your own node with Electrum. Alrighty. Uh, next up. Um, box? Box? What? Huh? Next one is join in a box? Or join, join in box? Uh, actually this, uh, Lily wallet thing, but, um, this actually looks pretty interesting, but, um, sadly I was not able to, um, actually try it. There's only a Mac beta out right now with windows coming soon. Um, and both of those are icky and evil. Um, but you know, this looks like a, a really simple streamlined um wallet that's pretty much set up to make uh multi-sig vaults with cold cards um it is a really simple uh streamlined user interface um the entire um <clears throat> database of like your balances um pub keys etc cetera, etc cetera, are all by default um private and encrypted in between uses um and it looks like a really flexible um, design. It's got PSBT support. Um, you can actually directly manage um, different accounts um, through the same wallet. And um, it's got some interesting um, features <clears throat> that it looks like um, the developer, uh, Kevin Mulcrone, is planning on really streamlining and fleshing out um, to allow um, kind of exporting um, keys or, or pub keys to other devices or wallets, <clears throat> you know, like, um, sorry, one second. Um, you know, like a uh, blue wallet for like a, a sub account. Um, and I'm seeing a, uh, or wait, hold on. Yeah, it, 
Blue Wallet and um, Caravan are the, the two things that can export um, public keys and other information to right now. But I'm also seeing um, a lot of potential synergy if you look at BIP85, um, the new BIP that Cold Card implemented, where you can deterministically generate new seeds um, derived down a derivation path from your master seed. Um, and that, you know, the potential to securely, um, pull sub keys, um, off of a single backup, uh, from a cold card like that and dump those into other software wallets, like actually have a full, um, you know, hot wallet key that this spits out for you to use in blue wallet. Um, and you only ever have to worry about the one master backup for all of your wallets. Um, I think this would be a huge jump off point um, as far as trying to push that type of functionality and compatibility. And, um, you know, honestly, it, it looks like a really solid, easy to use uh, multi-sig wallet. And I'm kind of hoping that after he gets a Windows release out there, he eventually gets around to Linux because, uh, you know, I'd actually like to play with the wallet itself and not just look at videos and pictures. <laughs> All right, now though, join inbox. Um, so this is a really cool um, <clears throat> graphical menu for join market. It's kind of like the GUI with the old school DOS um, like menu prompt, um, like the old terminal style ones. Um, that's specifically set up to run with the whole Raspi Blitz stack um, so that you can just have a, a simple to use, um, constantly running um, MakerBot for join market. And this is really fucking cool. Just because, you know, unlike um, zero link um, implementations like Samurai and Wasabi, Join market is just a, a open marketplace where anybody can come in and offer liquidity and charge a fee for that. So th this looks like a really awesome um, attempt to kind of make this really simple and easy to use. And, you know, when is somebody going to make the HSM on the cold card work with fucking coin joins? Come on, guys. Make money by making the money fungible. You know you want to. Alrighty though. Uh big chunk of wallet releases and updates aside though. Uh wanna take us a little deeper into uh this report we kinda cursorily touched on a while back. Did the cats eat you? Oops, I was not a, I, I keep forgetting to select the mumble window. Um, anyway, so yeah, episode 218, uh, Shinobi had talked about some excerpts from the OXT research paper um, written by, I think, Ergo BTC and published by Samurai about the Lazarus group, which is the North Korean uh, cybercrime group. And the at the time the whole paper was behind a paywall and um i've had the paper for more than a month now but i wanted to wait until it was fully public to give an update because i think that would be better because then you can actually check it for yourself in the show notes so the report um includes um as it summarizes at the beginning an overview of the hacks and available information provided in the complaint commentary on the alleged laundering of funds referenced in the complaint an analysis of the ongoing coin laundering alluded to in the complaint and a description of post-mix spending behavior and destinations of mixed coins um, just in summary, the complaint by the U.S. attorney for the District of Columbia had charged two, uh, two Chinese nationals with money laundering and operating an unlicensed uh, money service business. While the complaint does not name the exchanges that were targeted and hacked, uh, they just give pseudonyms. Um, this report uh, attempted to identify them uh, using publicly available information. Uh, the exchanges that were um, targeted include BitThumb, CoinRail, and Ubit. 
Uh, and then there's a bunch of other exchanges that they attempt to identify. Some of them um, not completely, but um, I think there was like two that were just uh, used uh, pseudonyms. One was suspected to be like a dark market exchange, I think. Um, but basically tried to identify the entities that were involved in the case, um, including ones where assets were seized during the forfeiture process. And uh, then the report goes into the evidence of so-called um, peeling chain action, which is, uh, as they say, generally traceable using a transaction graph tool, but peeling chains have an advantage of bypassing co uh, compliance software flags. Um, and rather than making a single large value deposit to a service, the total deposit is made in smaller amounts over a series of transactions. Um, however, the report also points out that there was uh, the use of custodial or what are referred to as custodial tumblers, which is basically you put money into a custodian and then you withdraw it and you, you have the chance or most of the time you will get different coins um withdrawing than the ones you put in or at least slight, a slightly different mixture of coins um and that was also a major factor because uh as the report says while peeling chains are implicated as the predominant method of attempted laundering in the complaint the major obfuscation method used by the conspirators was to transfer through kyc light or kyc free exchanges as part of phase two um, and even though they used two different mixers and allegedly uh, operated up to, the report claims, six simultaneous Wasabi mixing clients, um, because they engaged in cons uh, consolidation, which is poor post-mix behavior, it made the unmasking um, of the path of the coins and the uh, ownership of the coins themselves a lot easier. And they also note that the legal complaint alleges that the conspirators cashed out uh, $1.5 million in iTunes gift cards using the Paxful peer-to-peer -peer exchange, which uh, that is <laughs> that is a lot of gift cards. Um, I wonder if uh, they were successful in actually using any of them. Um, but the obviously the hot kind of hot button part of the report is, is that they characterize. Um, they basically claim that Wasabi has critical design flaws, um, particularly with the handling of unmixed chain. And while that, that I think is a problem, I would argue overall the 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 way in which um, the way in which these uh, coins were denomized and identified with this group is kind of a design hole slash problem that all coin join and in general, privacy wallets will have to face and will be hard to, quote, fix. Because if you have a user who is using your wallet in a way that it is not designed to be used um, with a very large amount of coins, and then once they leave your wallet is engaging in practices that are essentially reversing the privacy gains that they might have made with coin joins, you can't really do anything about that because even if you do implement much more rigorous post-mix uh, tools and strategies, which Samurai does offer a range of tools to do that, much more so than Wasabi does, um, once those funds are no longer locked into your model, there's nothing you can do about the bad practices that those users may end up using, like consolidating coins. Like you can't, you ultimately can't prevent them from doing that. And that seems to be a major factor here. And they'll, you know, they'll consolidate if they want to consolidate. Um, so I just, yeah, that was the kind of update on the commentary that was um, given before. And now the paper is actually available so you can read it for yourself. And I think, I don't know if, um, because they, they also, uh, I think they might have been actually sharing the data that they used to form this analysis. I don't know if that's also accessible. Um, I ha I'll have to check the page where the paper was available, but it might be. Okay. Yeah, if it is, we can just toss that in the show notes with this too. But yeah, I mean, it's <clears throat> there, there's nothing you can do to mitigate the damage that people like not using the proper behavior are going to cause like that just is what it is all righty so are we ready 
for some stupid ass drama. Well, there, there, there is a lot of stupid ass drama, so I'm not quite sure what you're referring to because I don't have the show notes open. So, more Bitcoin.org drama. How's that? So, three days ago, um, Cobra posted a long number of screenshots um, of a private conversation that he had with Will Bins, um, one of the biggest contributors to Bitcoin.org material, um, and said that uh, pretty much my initial response was um, Cobra is having a schizo fit again and imagining things. But he effectively asserted that Will is trying to take control or assert ownership over Bitcoin.org because of some proactive steps that he took um, to get a funding grant from BitMEX and um, attempted to reach out to another entity. Um, I'm trying to scroll and find it right now, but I'm forgetting off the top of my head. But um, yeah, set up a meeting with another entity to seek um, a second grant to just fund um, more content creation for Bitcoin.org. Um, and Cobra got into a very stupid, nuanced um, argument over not wanting to mingle those grants with previous um, donation funds to Bitcoin.org um, because of implications that that has on the ownership and again my initial read of this was cobra is having a schizo fit again and imagining things but upon cobra posting this and revoking will's access to the repo will immediately started a new account and responded to this um pretty much asserting ownership um, of the domain be and the site because of the the time and the depth to which he has been involved and talking about getting lawyers to um, stop Cobra from, air quote, illegally seizing the Bitcoin.org domain. Um, and it's like, I, I am just at a loss right now for how to look at this because it's this simple. Cobra owns that domain. It's his. And um, yeah, Will is just way absurdly, ridiculously out of line. Um, it's really absurd. Like if he had not asserted that, if he had just tried to communicate more, calm down, like work this out with Cobra, um, th this would have potentially been something that could be dealt with. Um, Cobra would look like an insane, irrational person. But now William is just, you know, like he's making the insane schizo who just screams insane shit all the time um, correct in one of those schizo moments by just making a completely baseless assertion to ownership over that domain, um, point blank. And it's just, this is absurd. Um, this is probably going to keep spiraling. And yeah, um, we're going to get a lot of stupid drama around this website again. Um, yay. Beep boop. Mm -hmm. So I guess that's uh, you up last with some hilarious news about... AML Bitcoin coin. Yeah, I vaguely remember hearing about this just because it they had a very uh they had a very law enforcement esque logo that I remember. Um, but I did not look very closely at it because it just sounded ridiculous. But um, it turns out that it's even more ridiculous than I originally thought. Um, basically, a U.S. grand jury. Uh, I think this was on the 24th. Uh, I think it was the 24th. Um, a U.S. grand jury has indicted a guy named Rowland Marcus Andrade. I think that's how you pronounce his name for wire fraud, money laundering and other charges related to his role as CEO of the National Atten Coin Foundation. 
because since at least July 2017, Andrade, or Andrade, Andrade, um, has been promoting and operating a scheme known as AML Bitcoin, which he claimed would comply with anti-money laundering, also referred to as AML, and know your customer KYC regulations and laws by using biometric technologies, among other methods, to confirm the identities of participants in transactions. And they, uh, 2017, 2018, I can't remember exactly which year, but they basically did an ICO and they said, well, these aren't quite the AML Bitcoins, but you can have these tokens for now and you can convert them into AML Bitcoins when that comes out. Um, of course, that never happened. And in the process, um, at, uh, as far as we know, um, I mean, there might be more than one victim, but... Uh, there's only one victim, I think, that's cited in the indictment, which is someone who was stupid enough to give them, I think it was like several, $700 uh, as an investment um, into this thing. And of course, this guy proceeded. Uh, the money laundering part uh, stems from the fact that he basically took this money that he made and uh, funneled it through a bunch of accounts uh, and ended up buying a house with it, which is apparently owned by him and his wife. Uh, whoever decided to marry this man, uh, you don't have my sympathy, or, well, you do, but you kind of don't. Uh, and there was something else. Uh, oh yes, he was also claiming to have, uh, connections with, like, the government of Panama, and something to do with that, which, you know, that, that sounds like a great, uh, uh, way to advertise the fact that your AML KYC compliant is going to the uh, Panama government. <laughs> not, notoriously, not notoriously known for that kind of thing. But um, yeah, so the history behind this is that in August 2017, um, which was shortly after they supposedly began promoting the scheme, uh, Coin Center had commented on rumors of a, quote, bizarre and poorly drafted digital currency bill that uh, supposedly was being circulated to Congress by this project, and that draft of the bill advocated for creating separate requirements for merchants that used anonymous versus so-called compliant digital currencies. Um, obviously to uh, say that, oh well, ours is going to be compliant, so you should use it. and. Coin Center also highlighted the fact that AML Bitcoin uh, had, quote, recently teamed up with the disgraced former lobbyist Jack Abramoff, who served time in federal prison for fraud, corruption, and conspiracy to produce a reality TV show about lobbying Congress on digital currency. Um, so unsurprisingly, I think it was a day after, um, possibly on the same day, I can't remember precisely, it was the 24th or 25th, but the grand jury has since filed a criminal complaint against Abramoff as well, um, as a co-conspirator, but also he, uh, is, uh, he's going to be charged for failure to register under the Lobbying Disclosure Act, uh, because after being released from prison, uh, he has uh, apparently spent the last several years marketing himself as a penitent reformer. And in their statement on the complaint, the U.S. Attorney's Office noted that this is the first ever known prosecution of a lobbyist for a criminal violation of the Lobbying Disclosure Act. Furthermore, in the actual uh, indictment, uh, it states that Abramoff was aware of the obligations to register as a lobbyist in part because Congress amended provisions of the Lobbying Disclosure Act in 2007 as a reaction to Abramoff's past, contact, uh, past conduct as a lobbyist. That is a pretty big burn. <laughs> yeah. Um, but why would I launder money? I'm the anti-money laundering guy. Didn't you hear? Yeah, it it kind of like it's like a tale as old as yesterday, where you know he had the DEA agent who was supposedly uh you know investigating money laundering or at least drug trafficking involving uh, Silk Road, and then he ends up engaging in uh, money laundering himself. Awesome life choices. Alrighty though. Um... 
it's almost it's almost like the people who are advocating for these systems uh may have some ulterior motives it just might be it just might be uh yeah um i guess that's a wrap for the day and final thoughts time i am still like brain hung over from the special edition yesterday yeah uh well i'm not hung over but uh yeah that was that was definitely a long one the the most interesting part for me was uh learning about how they chose the name because that's something that i hadn't heard about yet at all yeah i thought that was just like a silly um like name that was totally arbitrary but that is like a, a really i think poetic meaning behind that uh yeah uh got a final thought yeah i have a few so the first one is kind of a small update to um in the last episode 225 we talked about the news with the open technology fund corporation and a supposed ongoing lobbying effort to push their funds towards closed source tools rather than open source ones and um, I don't know what his position is, but there's been an email that's been sent out to some people, probably people on the mailing list of OTF, from a Nat Kretsch, Kretschkin, Kretschkin uh, basically saying like that the amount of support that people have shown over the past week or so has has uh i i don't know i didn't actually know that there was frozen funds but he says that their 2020 funds were unfrozen today um i don't know what that means i guess that means they have control back of like where the money's going maybe a bit unclear but um he says many things about the future of otf remain uncertain and we will no doubt be relying on you all for more help going forward um so that's just a small update on that um also it would be way too big of a job for me to have inserted uh, a analysis of the uh, superseding indictment that has been filed by the Justice Department in the case of Assange, but I recommend um, there. there's a number of people who have broken it down, and one of those people is a guy named Kevin, I think his name is Kevin Gostola, one second. Yeah, Kevin Kevin Gottstola, um, G O S Z T O L A. Um, so he always does really great breakdowns of, uh, especially the stories involving WikiLeaks, and he did a long thread about the um, history and impact of the latest indictment, which is actually, it's. In terms of the, you know, because Assange faces up to 175 years in prison with uh, if all the charges are accepted, um, this superseding indictment would only affect, uh, I think, five years out of the total. I think that's what they've said. But it is, ex uh, as he says, it's expanding the scope of the computer crime conspiracy charge to basically include, like times where either Assange or someone associated with WikiLeaks has appeared at a conference and basically said, hey, sources, give us documents. Um, that is apparently solic solicitation to conspiracy. That's what they're claiming, which is so bizarre because how many news organizations around the world um, have a, you know, a tip, a, a little tip note at the end of their story saying, hey, do you know anything about this? Send us, send a, contact us, send us information. Like every new, news organization does that. Um, and then also a bunch of stuff where it's like they're alleging that they conspired with Anonymous to hack companies or that they participate in the hack. It's just, it's a whole bunch of stuff that doesn't affect the like a huge portion of the case but it's mostly a pr thing to you know once again bring this up and make people not want to support him so i recommend reading his analysis and then in a good news kind of final thought um 
a uh, a developer going by Candle Hater on Twitter. You may know uh, he is doing a crowdfund to add a uh, Bitcoin satellite kit integration, uh, the Blockstream satellite, to Raspi Blitz. So if you, I don't know if it's actually succeeded. I think it only started yesterday. But if you uh, have any spare sats, um, I think he only needs about nine hundred dollars. So. Uh, if you want to help with that effort, um, go and check out um, his handle on Twitter. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I guess, I don't know. Not a thought per se, but I guess my last comment, um, especially in light of the big fuck up uh, of the Liquid Federation and this new analysis that I think is very shattering of the previous perceptions of Lightning's payment privacy model. Um, You know, this is what it's going to be like trying to continue to build out and scale infrastructure on top of a system like this. And this is exactly why things are structured in a way in terms of layering on top of Bitcoin to compartmentalize things, to isolate those risks and those changes in different operational models to the people who opt into them rather than globalizing them across the entire system. Like that is exactly why the general attitude shifted to supporting this mode of scaling because it does not create a global risk for the entire system to try new complex or different things. So like, yeah, um, there's reason to be pessimistic looking at those things, or you can find a reason to be optimistic. That base is still there. Um, everything being built on top of it right now could completely fail and it's still there to try to build new things on. So yeah, like Bitcoin is growing up. That's going to be messy. And on that note, I guess, hope you guys enjoyed. Catch you later, punks. Bye. Was there, was there, that's a good